Hello tanks and tankettes, welcome to Supporter Spotlight number 14. We're a little bit delayed with this one, but as I said in the uh, previous tanks video, the T46 live play on the NA server, it's been a bit of an off week for me, so that's kind of just delayed things generally. I will also say, this is another mixed video, I've done a couple of these where there's uh, tanks replays and warships replays in at the same time. But I've decided, based on feedback from you lot watching, that I'm gonna, in future, put the warships replays at the end, so that you'll... If you're just here for the tanks, you can just stop watching at that point, basically. So we're kicking things off with Walking Alone, and uh, this is... Well, this is actually his second appearance on the, uh, on the channel. Um, previously, he'd had a game um, where I referred to him as Gallant Human, which is... is uh, name on uh, various other places, um, but uh, of all the the videos we're seeing today, of all the replays, his is the only uh, one where we've uh, had one of his on previously. Everybody else is uh, basically new to the series. He's in the Cromwell B. He's got uh, pretty good matchmaking, although there are some tier sevens, but very very few. And the Cromwell B, well, it is pretty much just a Cromwell, but that makes premium uh, money, so it, it's a very, very nice machine. The T-3485 Rudy is in exactly the same position, and both of them will very likely be on sale. In fact, I think in EU, the Rudy has already been on sale in the Christmas, Christmas advent calendar. The Cromwell B almost certainly will be, and uh, it's, well, depending on the price, probably one of the more worthwhile ones if you enjoy medium tanks and enjoy the Cromwell in particular. So this is actually an assault game. You don't see too many of these. He is, well, he could be maybe trying to use the terrain a bit more here, but he's just content for now to sit and try and put some fire in on these uh, uh, these tanks. Now, when I say he could be a bit more forward, he could be basically using his excellent mobility to, uh, at the very least, spot for his uh, teammates that are here on this ridge line. I mean, instead he's just hanging back here and using his guns as, uh, as uh, guns, gun as well. Although he did say in his replay description that he has got, I think, optics all this. So he was probably still doing a bit of spotting for his teammates there anyway. But of course, the defenders in that position have the benefit of some tree cover to work with. However, I mean, despite that, uh, and he is moving up now, um, they've been able to do some damage to these people. They've actually taken out the, uh, the flak bus. The Panther is very badly damaged, the SU-100 is pretty damaged, and there is the SU-100. And uh, as uh, Walking Alone was able to make this approach undetected, he takes that guy completely by surprise. Now it looks like the Panther has gone away completely, but he has discovered another thing to shoot at. An E2, and it's a derp E2, which he has to be a little bit wary of. Frontally, it shouldn't be a problem, but if the guy shoots him in the sidearm and he's only just now reacting to being shot at, and yeah, that could have been nasty. That could have been really very nasty, but he got kind of lucky there. It was less than 200 damage, and it did knock out his gunner, but it hasn't otherwise done any module damage. But if that had, you know, penned and set him on fire or damaged his engine, or it could have been, like I say, nasty. Yes, I, I think I may have covered that point already. Anyway, there's a very badly damaged Panther. Um, this enemy team didn't actually offer that much resistance, and uh, he's been able to rack up with his mobility. I mean, he was able to just come round, rack up those three kills. There's plenty more opportunity for damage and kills. And, oh, there's that Cromwell gun handling. Yeah, now that's unfortunate. That's a, a big chunk of his health he's just lost. He's down to less than half health now. And the BDR, despite being a tier lower, uh, despite being bottom tier heavy, you know, uh, the the 90 mil gun with a 240 alpha against even higher tier medium tanks it can be painful. Gotcha. So Cromwell, oh, not Cromwell, um, Firefly had some warning of him being there, but uh, uh, walking alone's reflexes were better. His shot went true, and he took out that guy. He also took out the 87. So that's another two kills. The ARL that was there. Um, not the ARL, uh, it was... Uh, no, there was an ARL, but uh, that was elsewhere that got killed. Uh, the Panther that was there got killed by something. The ARL was uh, there, got killed by something else. Uh, I'm just cont totally confusing myself now. And it's now down just to this VKD, and of all the shots he fires on the move there, which is never the best uh, plan in a Cromwell, the last one does actually connect, so he gets the final kill as well. 
So that was a rather nice top gun, that was worth an ace mastery, and it was also rather profitable because he also got, I think, a bit of spotting in this game as well. No tracking damage though, as you can see. But that was enough, 7 kills, 1900 damage to put him at the top of the team. And because it was a tier 7 game and because he did do damage against some tier 7s, that put him well above um, the only other tank that actually did more damage than him, the, the Tiger with 2400 damage, the 2500 damage. Some of those were very low health kills that he was running around mopping up, but that's a thing that Cromwell is good for with its rel relatively fast rate of fire and its uh, very good mobility. So there you go, nearly 1500 um, spotting damage it would have been as well on top of the 1900 actual damage done. And all in all that got him 58,000 credits and as this was a times 5 daily he had over 11,000 XP. So yes, the Cromwell B, it's a pretty nice machine and uh, if you have any interest in mediums at all, as I said, it is coming up for sale during Christmas, and uh, I think, depending on the price, it's one I can recommend. Next up, we have this artillery replay from Redman36. And, well, it's not the first time we've had an RT replay on this series, but this is a rather different sort of artillery. The last one, I believe, was a Crusader SP, which is still a Tier 7, but this is a rather different Tier 7 RT. This is the infamous S51. And if you're wondering why it's infamous, well, you're going to see why. You're definitely going to see why. Now, this is actually, I think, unique in that you research it from a heavy tank. There are some RTs, uh, there's at least one, uh, the French... Uh, on the French line that you research or can research from a light tank, but this the only way to get this is to research it from the KV-2 and it is unique in that regard. It's, it's the only artillery that's not kind of on the main artillery branch of its uh, respective nation. And you actually start off with basically an arty version of the KV-2's gun, 152 mil. But one of the reasons why this is so feared is that the upgraded gun, the 203 mil, is basically the tier 9 artillery gun. It's the same caliber, I think it does pretty much the same damage, although it has worse accuracy, worse reload, it carries less ammo. It's just kind of, it's a gimped version of the tier 9 arty, that's how they've tried to balance it, but it hits for tier 9 damage and it's a tier 7. And this is one of those games where the gods were smiling on Redman 36, as you can see. Yes. Yes. Now, I don't know where that penned exactly. That was clearly a penetrating artillery hit. And because this thing can hit for... I don't even know. It's something like 1800, 1900 on an average HE penetration roll. It can easily wipe out a tier 8 heavy tank. And that's what he's got to shoot at. So, he utterly annihilated that T-32. There's a T-34 there as well. He actually held fire on the ARL. I, he could have fired, but he decided he was going to hold back the shell for something bigger and more dangerous. And, well, that's the T-34 that was sitting next to the T-32. Will he get lucky again? Yes. Yes is the answer. He will get lucky again. That was 3,000 damage in the space of uh, less than two and a half minutes. Or, well, just about two and a half minutes from the, the start of the, the, the match. So, yeah, this basically does not happen very often. This is an outlier. But I have had this experience myself. I mean, the S51, it has many things are going against it. You can see here the horribly narrow gun traverse, the long aim time the long reload time, the horrible accuracy, but it's just the random nature of World of Tanks, especially as regards artillery, that sometimes you'll get matches like this. Can he repeat it? Can he have a third one-shot kill, this time against uh, a tier 7? And the answer is no. <laughs> You'd think the T29 would be even easier, but uh, the RNG gods decided this time that although he had a hit, quite possibly it was a hit into the tracks or a hit into the turret, and uh, did a lot of damage, but it did not kill him. So we've skipped to um, basically the very end. He did try one more shot in the meantime that missed, and he's maybe looking to get this final kill, but no, his, uh, his actual uh, teammate artillery gets it instead. So that was a high calibre and a goals medal with, what was that, three shots fired, four shots fired? We'll actually see on the end plate. Those two hits against the T-32 and the T-34, that is the stuff of artillery players' wet dreams right there. 
Nearly 4,000 damage, nearly 1,000 base XP, top of his team, and that's because they were higher tiers. And although artillery usually gets terrible XP for those kind of shots, because, of course, you have to um, share the XP with whoever's spotting at the time. There we go, four shots fired, three hits. Um, in this case, it was enough damage against higher tiers that it was still enough to put him at the top of the team. And this was all in less than, than five minutes. So nuking those two tier rates almost certainly drastically changed the, the like it sped up that flank so much and i'm sure proponents of artillery would say well yes that's what it's there for um but uh well you know i've had discussions of artillery before so this is not that sort of a video this is just look at the rng i suppose so there you go that's that's redman 36's uh, first appearance on the channel but i'm sure it won't be his last lastly at least as far as the world of tanks replays goes we have this Chaffee game from Lunar Eyes, again a newcomer to the channel, and this is kind of an antidote to the last game. If you felt that watching artillery has somehow, you know, that those one shots have, have made a little bit of your soul die inside, uh, then uh, hopefully this will restore you in some way. Now this is not a good map particularly for scouts. There are really only one or two routes where you can use to especially try and get through to enemy RT. And there are three RT on each team in this case. But it really depends on uh, surviving to a late enough stage of the game, waiting for a gap that you can basically get in and exploit and... Um, try and get through to an, an enemy base because otherwise there's limited spotting positions and he was able to get a, a very sneaky kill there and although it almost certainly gave his position away and although this is almost certainly giving his position away um, this kind of opportunistic fire is pretty much otherwise all you can do now i'm not quite sure what that e25 was uh, i mean clearly he's trying to get up behind the uh, the kb85 that went a bit ham but I think in his haste to try and get in there and, and steal the kill, which he didn't even manage to, he unnecessarily exposed himself to taking a bunch of damage. And I think the only damage he actually did end up taking was from Lunar Rise. But in the end, it was one of the Cromwells that was a, a little bit further up on, uh, what, C2? That corner there, anyway, that actually uh, got the kill. And, well, apparently he didn't learn his lesson the first time either. I mean, clearly there's a tank here shooting at him. Clearly there's multiple tanks around shooting at him, and he just kind of whizzed out into the open, maybe trusting that his speed would save him, but it was not to be. Now, an enemy scout has actually made it through to the base, and to their credit, the friendly, uh, the allied uh, mediums that are up here are actually reacting, but the problem is they're all reacting. All but two of them are rushing back to take out an ELC. So it's a little bit of an overreaction, especially considering it leaves uh, just an M4 and an M4E2 to try and hold back several enemy mediums. It's, it's not ideal. Lunar Eyes uses this opportunity to make a move. Now this is pretty much the only route, at least starting from the other side, to sneak up. The enemy ELC must have basically done the same through the middle of the map to get up to uh, their cap. But it's a lot easier for the mediums in the north to get back and defend than it will be for the enemies in the south to get back and defend, except that OI experimental is still there. However, despite this being tremendously risky, and he easily could have shot Lunar Rise in the back, he's really not paying attention. And I don't know if Lunar Rise was counting on that, I don't know if Lunar Rise just thought he'd take the chance, maybe he thought the OI experimental had moved to a different position, I don't know. But it's worked out, I mean it's risky, but it's worked out. Now one of the RTs has tried to, uh, I mean they know he's here, they have tried to take a pot shot at him. He's taken out one, this is actually his second kill, and there's the MX-13 who possibly wasn't the one that shot at him because he seems rather surprised by the appearance of a scout behind him that's just killed him. The OI experimental, meanwhile, still sitting up there being a tank destroyer, I guess, and yeah, it's uh, technically a tier 7 game, but there was, what, two tier 7s on each team? Um, let's see, the enemy team had three tier 7s, this team had uh, also three. One of the tier 7s on this team was actually uh, an arty. So, it's not great matchmaking for an OI experimental, but still, that was a bit of a waste. Now, he's pretty low health, and I think Lunarize was just looking for the enemy arty at this point, but 
Um, this guy, well, really wasn't much of a threat. So, there's another kill. Why not? Bit of extra damage. So we're going to skip ahead a little bit here. The hunt for the arty actually went on for a good couple of minutes at the end of the game. Now, there was the Griller as well as the, the, the this Cromwell, but they found the Cromwell a lot easier. And Lunar Eyes actually manages to get in another shot, but there we go. The M12 actually ends up taking him down. He doesn't have a lot of allies left, and actually... There's a guy there with minus one. Now, the guy he killed was the Fury. They were all platooned up together, and he basically just did it because, well, I guess they were all on team speak and mucking around, but it's not the best idea, even so. The game doesn't know that because you platooned up, you're just mucking around. The game doesn't know that at all. So the Griller has actually managed to get round to their base somehow, and it was only really him appearing and taking out their M44 that gave the game away. So there we go, Lunar Eyes steams in, takes the last kill, and gets a Pascucci's medal. Three artillery kills. I did tell you this would be something of an antidote to the last game, didn't I? It was also enough for an Ace Mastery, and... I don't know how hard the Chaffee is to master these days, probably a lot easier than it was the old uh, with the old Chaffee, but still, 5 kills, 1600 damage, and he had a bit of spotting, but not actually that much, considering he was in a scout. Um, it was still enough, and it was all against high tiers, and that's one of the, the nice things about being in a, a, a fast scout, the, the fact that they get rougher matchmaking than other tanks. It doesn't matter so much once you get to tier 5. Some of the tier 4 scouts aren't particularly well suited to it, though. So as we can see, he hit most of the shots he actually uh, uh, aimed, and 500 uh, spotting and assistance plus the 1600 uh, actual assistance done, more than enough for an ace. So all in all, that was a very nice little scout game and uh, a very nice, well-earned Pascucci's. And so, on to the warship. So, if you've just been here for the tanks, I guess this is my time to say goodbye, and thanks for watching the rest of it. And if you're here for the rest of it, well, I hope you enjoy this particular game. This is the first time we've had this particular machine on the channel. This is the uh, regular Tier 7 American Destroyer. Of course, there's the premium uh, Sims as well, which was one of the pre-order ships. Uh, but this thing, well, it is like its uh, uh, brethren, I guess that's the way, best way to put it. Uh, it's a good dogfighter, it's got very fast firing guns, it's got very fast turning turrets. So it's a very good machine for taking on other destroyers with, but he will get to use his uh, torpedoes in this. I should say, this is uh, Armorama. Um, he's actually been a long time viewer and is uh, uh, now a, a patron. And this is not the first time he's been on the channel at all, actually. I think he's had at least one World of Tanks replay up. But that was a while ago. So, uh, yeah, I'll also mention, as well, uh, that I, I, I do every time I uh, see uh, uh, Amarama on, or Jim, as his name is, uh, he runs the uh, Kitmaker Network, which is a, a group of websites devoted to uh, mostly scale modelling, uh, military scale modelling, and I like to go and peruse through sometimes and see the stuff that people are doing because there are some very, very talented people sharing their modeling work on the web. And not just, you know, the, the, the stuff they do with um, uh, uh, bought kits. And actually, the, the, his site, if you've got any interest, it's worth checking out. They do kind of reviews and photo sets and all that kind of thing. Um, but uh, seeing people not only do that kind of stuff, but then you get the really talented people that do scratch builds of things, and it's it's like the the dedication is quite impressive. Anyway, there is actually a subsite of that um, that's uh, dedicated to to uh, uh, PC gaming. Although um, I think most of the content at the moment is basically uh, my videos going up on there as well, but. Uh, Stuff like World of Tanks and World of Warships is a good fit. I'm sure a lot of people that are, you know, that have interest in kind of military modelling and this era of, of tanks and ships, uh, probably uh, a lot of them are also playing World of Warships and, and World of Tanks, and maybe now Armoured Warfare as well, because there are a lot of people out there with an interest in this kind of thing. Anyway, he's put out his first batch of torpedoes. They're not particularly long-range torpedoes on the Mahan. I think the best you get is... 6.4 kilometers and I think it's the same on the the tier 6 which I want to say is the Farragut I can't remember exactly but yeah the American destroyers are not particularly blessed with long-range torps they're better dogfighters basically they have very fast turning turrets 
And there we go, he actually does manage two hits, so that must have been on uh, that Otago. So he's also engaged this Hataharu, who, well, I mean, the guns of the Japanese destroyers, I think people, they look at the turret turn and they get a bit deceived, but if you look at the actual damage they do, the guns on the Japanese destroyers are quite potent. It's just, they don't get to use them as easily because they uh, have a much slower turret turn times to work with, and they also have a slower rate of fire to work with, but if you can hit people with them, they're quite nasty little guns. Anyway, he's taken a bit of damage himself, he had his rudder knocked out, so he's had to repair, but there we go, he's just burned out this Hatsuharu, so that's fine. There's another Mahan very close by, he's going to have to be careful about that guy, because he's full health. Whereas uh, Jim has lost a bit of health at this point himself. But he does have a Cleveland in very close support. And the Cleveland is quite dangerous to destroyers. At least up close. Um, I think beyond 6, 7, 8 kilometers, it gets very, very hard with the shell travel time to uh, uh, get destroyers with a Cleveland. Because they can just have... Uh, Increasing amounts of time to take evasive action basically you, you can see the shells coming in from miles away with the Cleveland Anyway, there's that Mahan who for some reason was backing up to I don't even know I mean he clearly had dropped uh, torpedoes already. We saw the spread co uh, go past so Why he then decided to start reversing up instead of using his speed to get away? I don't know but it makes this particular torpedo drop particularly easy and although Again, Jim's lost some health in the engagement. Um, he's just wiped out another enemy destroyer. The enemy team has now only got one left. And of the destroyers killed, um, Jim's dead. responsible for... Uh, uh, Two-thirds of the enemy team? Yeah, the enemy team had three, and he's killed two of them. So that's not bad. That's not bad at all. So at this point, I think he decides... I, I mean, looking at what's going on on the rest of the, the mini-map... They've got two cap circles. Most of the team is clustered around the A cap circle. Their Hatsuharu is near the C cap circle and engaging a pair of cruisers. And probably being very cautious about it as well because um, cruisers are pretty dangerous. In fact, the remaining de enemy destroyer, the Mutsuki, is over there as well. But Jim decides at this point, clearly, that um, this is a good opportunity to try and get through to the enemy carrier. Now, there are only a uh, tier 6 carrier on each side in a... Well, this is a tier 8 game, really, but there's only a couple of tier 8s. But still, taking out the enemy carrier would be a, a, a nice chunk of health. It would help out his team, and it would just be satisfying as well. There's nothing more satisfying than sneaking through and killing a carrier in your destroyer. It's almost old-school World of Tanks in that regard. Uh, it used to be, um, back when there weren't that many dedicated scouts in the game, you had the... Um, the chaffee, I mean, we've already had, you know, the new chaffee. The old chaffee was, um, it, it's a hard one to, I, I can't really describe the old chaffee's role that well, because I never had one, but uh, the, the T-50-2 was the artillery killer. That was what you used to sneak through the enemy lines with your raw speed and uh, excellent handling ability. And uh, you would just look for gaps, you would get through, and you would go murder the enemy arty. And it's a bit harder these days. There aren't many scouts that are really, really good at that. The ELC is fast enough, certainly, but the nature of the ELC's gun means that you have to wait an awful long time to uh, 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 kill a lot of enemy arties. Anyway, we've gone rather off topic now. One of the cruisers that was around sea has actually sort of wandered south, and they've basically gone right into his uh, firing range. So this is a bit dangerous. Now... The fact that Jim's not alone is really useful. The fact that this Cleveland is here to help him out, to put that rate of fire to use. Although the Megami unquestionably has the better guns, the Cleveland's rate of fire, especially if he's using HE, uh, makes this more of an even fight than you would think just looking at the uh, the tiering spread. In World of Tanks terms, you know, this would be uh, a tier 6 medium versus a tier 8 medium backed up by a light tank. And... Unless the tier 8 medium really screwed up, it probably wouldn't go very well. But as it is, that Cleveland was able to kill the Megami with a bit of help from Jim. You know, he got some damage there himself, but I think it was largely the Cleveland that was doing the work. However, this enemy uh, independence has kind of noticed that there's a destroyer coming for him. So Jim now has, uh, well, he's got the risk of uh, planes coming for him and... 
Actually, in a destroyer, dive bombers are more of a threat than the torpedo bombers. The torpedo bombers are easier to avoid, although a well-placed manual spread can still take out a destroyer. But, uh, well, this, uh, this carrier is not going to do a well-placed manual spread at all. As you can see. I think it was actually a manual drop, but it was so far away uh, as to make evasion um, rather a trivial matter. He really didn't have to work hard to evade those torpedoes. In his haste to get away, this independence has run aground, which just makes these shots all the easier. However, he's also well, well within range of all the remaining enemy ships that are in the area as well. Now, there is one thing going for Jim here. All of these ships were engaging his allied ships to the north, so for the most part, hopefully, their guns are going to be pointed the wrong way, and because there's only one cruiser in that lot, even if they're now all turning their guns round on him, it's going to take time. Now there is a Nuremberg there, but he has some cover from the island, so he's basically just keeping his guns hammering away at the Independence, trying to set him back on fire again. Although, I think, to be honest, uh, now, the, you might have noticed by this point, by the way, there's a bit of a, a bug with this replay. Um, for some reason, the shells weren't showing up. So you can see the damage numbers. You can't see the shells coming out, but you can see the damage numbers. But it looks like he's firing at the Independence's hull rather than the uh, the flight deck and superstructure. And I think if he'd been doing that, the shells would have been doing more damage and um, probably penning more. But, uh, well, this New Mexico has come around the corner and is gunning for him, and I think the Nuremberg might be firing shots in his direction as well. It's hard to tell when the shells don't show up. But he's now got a bit of a problem because he's down to 44 health. The next anything that hits him will kill him, and he can't get close enough to drop torpedoes because, as with um, all of the American destroyers, I, I think, if you don't have the relevant tier 5 captain skill, I think maybe even if you do have the relevant tier 5 captain skill, you basically can't drop from stealth. That's more a specialty of the Japanese destroyers. So, he really can't get close enough to output a large amount of damage into the New Mexico. It would just be plain suicidal. Ordinarily, even um, just, you know, under the best of circumstances, getting up close to a, a, a battleship to do damage is difficult. They have to be distracted by um, allies, if not multiple allies. You have to be able to get the jump on them. You have to be able to be sneaky and use terrain. But as it was, he gets away with his life because they've just won on points. Now, they controlled most of the cap points for that game, so they were steadily racking up uh, points all the while, and his team were clearly um, by far getting the better of the enemy team. So, uh, overall, um, that was a rather nice game, and Jim was able to capitalise very nicely on what his team was doing. He was able to kill those destroyers, which, um, you know, tier for tier worth more XP than a battleship or a, a, a cruiser. And he was actually able to kill their uh, carrier as well. So, 22k damage, you know, 23k damage from torpedoes. 36k damage from HE shell hits and a further nearly 15k from fires and 6.5k from flooding. So all in all that added up to a rather nice chunk of damage. And although he only just got away with his life at the end there, he very easily could have died. I think even if he had died, uh, he, he still would have come out on top of that team easily. Uh, it just... Even though there's no such thing as spotting damage in this game, you know, the tiering still matters. Shooting at, uh, and damaging higher tiers still matters. Taking out enemy destroyers, like I said, is, is particularly profitable. So it was all enough to get that 3,000 base XP result. And I think it was a very nice result indeed. So, as ever, you can uh, do the usual things. You can leave comments about any or all of the replays you've seen today. You can hit the like or dislike button, as may be appropriate if you are particularly not a fan of artillery, and I would understand if you did that. Uh, you can subscribe to my channel if you aren't already, and, as always, stay tuned for more.